Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing this karaoke style. You're going to have to pick that up. It works. No big deal. It just has to be, uh, you said, hot and entertaining. Is that what we're doing right now? So um, I've known Robert Kaplan for about five years. Uh, he used to be a guest on a television show that I hosted for Bloomberg. Um, we talked about you know, having young kids. We talked about economics. And he is an object lesson for me in that you have to treat everyone you ever encounter with respect and care because you never know when somebody is going to become one of the 16 most powerful people in global finance. <laughs> okay. Um, good to remember. Good. So, um, you know, one of the reasons the Fed is, of course, important is that they make decisions about the, the price of debt. But um, one reason in which they're incredibly important is that the Fed presidents um, have access to CEOs all over the country. So they tend to have a better idea of what's going on in the actual economy than almost anyone. So we'll start right there with manufacturing. Uh, yesterday, uh, for the first time in three years, uh, uh, one manufacturing index in the US uh, dipped into contraction. That was a big deal. It caught our attention. We weren't expecting it. We put it above the fold on the Financial Times. So from your perspective, from the CEOs you talk to in your district, what is happening? Why are we in what you could call a manufacturing recession? So um, it's, good, it's worthwhile putting in context, in the United States at least, manufacturing is less than 15% of GDP, to be precise, around 11% of GDP. So when I talk to CEOs all through our district, we have over uh, 500, uh, Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, what, what they're saying is, uh, obviously, logistics, global supply chains have been challenged because of trade uncertainty. Uh, there's more questions about being able to sell into foreign markets. And, you know, all those things put a damper on the man. It's not surprising that manufacturing is weak in an environment where global trade is also weak. Uh, and so I think those two things go together. And so the, the, it, the good news is also you hear from CEOs, while manufacturing is weak and they're being very careful about CapEx, uh, the consumer's strong in the United States and that's 70% of the economy. So it's, it's a mixed picture in the US. I want to dig in on the word uncertainty that you just used. Uh, you've made a distinction in the past that I think it's important uh, for us here to understand is that there is a difference between feeling as a CEO like you're part of, like you're watching a trade negotiation and feeling like you're stuck in trade uncertainty. Draw that distinction for us. So when I say trade uncertainty, while a lot of the press about uh, trade right now is related to China, the trade uncertainty really emanates much more broadly than that. It has to do with trade uncertainty vis-a-vis -vis the US and Europe, obviously trade uncertainty between the US uh, and, and Canada and Mexico, uh, as well as uncertainty about China, and the reason as a group that matters, um, and I've given you this example, while uh, most US businesses I talk to are very supportive and, and think it makes a lot of sense to be going at uh, these issues, intellectual property, technology transfer with China, uh, in the midst of it, uh, you've got a trade threat against Mexico, even though it's not yet been ratified, but there's a new trade deal with Mexico and so businesses in my district, we're the largest exporting state in the United States, were, were furiously working to prepare for tariffs with Mexico, even in the aftermath of the resolution of the negotiation. And I'll tell you, the monetary impact they shared with me of those tariffs with Mexico would have been substantial for a number of them. Even though it didn't happen, what it did is, I think it, 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 there was a sea change I saw in that they internalized, you know, trade uncertainty is going to be with us regardless of whether you have arrangements or deals, bilateral deals or not. And what it means is you've got to be very cautious about making expansion plans, about CapEx, about your global plans. We need to start making preparations for worst case scenarios. And that's what's had the chilling effect. It's, it's not just uncertainty with uh, the negotiation with China, it's the understanding that you could have new news on, with no notice, uh, which could change your outlook and would cause you to need to change your plans. And that kind of uncertainty is what causes businesses to say, okay, fine, let's just slow down here and let's just, let's just wait a little bit. And that's what a lot of them are doing. 
I think you've made an important point. One of the things that I, I've also <clears throat> heard talking to CEOs is that uh, while we in Washington, I'm based in Washington, are hyper-focused on what's going on with China, a lot of businesses are really focused on renegotiation and passage of USMCA. That's far more important to most businesses in America. And, and I think most businesses I talk to are assuming that they don't want to focus too heavily on the blow by blow on how it happens. Mm -hmm. They're assuming that's going to happen. I think the part that they're struggling with is even with these bilateral arrangements, even if they get ratified, you could still have new news as they're learning. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they're not accustomed to having to adjust to this. Uh, they're, they're accustomed to trade uncertainty uh, and, and trade issues, but having pretty good visibility on how to adapt. Right now, they don't feel they do. Because the, d the difference is we're no longer negotiating a trade deal. We have experienced a shift in trade regime. It's, it's that uh, tariffs, uh, get staying away from the wisdom or not of that strategy, tariffs are not being used for a variety of purposes. Uh, not necessarily uh, trade-related. They could be national security-related. They could be to achieve other ends. And businesses a little bit across various industries in different ways are caught in the middle of that. And uh, they're, they, they, they're starting to come to the conclusion they actually can't predict how it's going to get resolved. And once they've came to that conclusion, the appropriate and rational thing to do is to be more careful. And that's why we're seeing CapEx uh, be more sluggish. It varies by industry, yeah. but that's a little bit of why you're seeing that. And it's consistent with weakness in, uh, in manufacturing. It's not surprising. So one of the great luxuries that America has is uh, a lot of consumers who like to buy things. And that has always been, that has been a cushion uh, 2015, 2016. Um, it seems to be a cushion so far now. Uh, yeah. So you said, you know, manufacturing is only 11% of U.S. GDP. It's only 8% of U.S. workers. That's right. Um, draw, if you can, the connection between what happens in manufacturing now and what will happen with consumers this fall. Because we did see, again, a surprising dip in consumer confidence, uh, uh, which is not a perfect indicator of consumer spending in the future, but it is a, it is a weak indicator. So, so let's start with why the consumer is strong. The consumer is strong because we've got the tightest job market uh, in the last 50 years, um, uh, and, uh, and, and household balance sheets over the last 10 years since the Great Recessions, consumer balance sheets in the U.S. have improved. Not because they've reduced debt so much, but they haven't increased their debt and their incomes have gone up. So when you add that together, the consumer's got the capacity to spend. The issue is decelerating global growth, weakness in manufacturing. Do those, does that weakness spread uh, into other parts of the economy, understanding that in excess of 40, 45 percent of uh, S&P 500 revenues come from outside the United States. Does that weakness seep into the other parts of the economy? And what, you, what, what I'm watching for is, is, that, is this weakness going to intensify to where X number of months from now you see one or two weak job reports and then psychologically the consumer decides, I need to be more careful. Uh, and so I, I think that the consumer, our studies, we were just going through a research paper yesterday at the Dallas Fed. We think the consumer is actually very well aware and plays close attention to macro developments. And so trade uncertainties probably has some effect on confidence. But in particular, if consumers thought the job market mm -hmm. was going to be weaker, which we don't see yet, but that's what I'm watching for. Uh, you'll see a change in the consumer. So I, we're spending a lot of time at the Dallas Fed discussing what are leading indicators and in the lingo, what are coincident indicators. And I think our view is um, that uh, the consumer and a strong consumer is a little bit coincident, meaning when it changes, you'll know it, but you may not get a lot of warning. And my own view, and you've heard me say this, if at the Fed and policymakers wait to see that weakness in the consumer, uh, then, that, then you may have waited too long. That weakness is probably fairly far along in the economy. Chalk it up. That was a dovish comment. Noted. Um, one of the things that has changed at the Fed, I just wanted to offer some context here, is that um, 
and this, is, this thinking has changed really in the last two or three years, is that we didn't used to know what would happen when we would get a truly hot labor market. We thought about it, um, but now that we actually have in the U.S. and have had for the last year a really tight labor market, we're getting all sorts of really good things that we had hoped for in the past. Uh, we're seeing people with a drug history, with a criminal record, uh, getting into jobs, getting into the workforce, getting a paycheck, getting trained. We're seeing workers, we're seeing companies volunteering to pay for things like training that they had been begging uh, the federal government to pay for for several years. Um, so. You know, we used to talk about there being a skills gap, that people needed to be trained up for the new economy. One of the things that I'm wondering is, was it always a company willingness to pay to train gap? So by the way, the skills gap is growing in the United States, get worse. And so, uh, and I'll pick up on some of the comments that were made earlier about inclusive growth. So one of the benefits of running a hot economy, and we have the luxury of doing this because inflation pressures, and I can go through why I think this is happening, have been muted. It gives us the luxury to run hotter. It means that underrepresented groups are more likely to get in the workforce, but more significantly stay in the workforce. They're more likely to go for training, skills training. Their employers are more likely to help encourage them to do that. Uh, and the reason I say there's a skills gap, we've got a structural problem in the United States, though, still. Uh, which is we're 25th out of 35 industrialized nations in math, science, and reading. By the way, Canada ranks very high globally on reading. The United States is lagging, okay? And so we've got to improve early childhood literacy and improve the whole education ecosystem. And we are lagging other countries in terms of beefing up school, uh, skills training. Often happens in partnership with junior colleges. Uh, we've got a lot of good examples of progress in the state of Texas but it's uneven in the United States. So there, why is there a skills gap? The reason there's a skills gap and growing is there's the demand for skills workers going up. Technology, technology-enabled disruption is increasing the demand for training to do any lots of jobs that didn't need that training 20 years ago. And while we're improving in the United States and providing skills training, we're, we're improving much more slowly then the opportunities are, pre are, creating, are pre presenting themselves. So that's why we've got shortages in the U.S. of skilled workers, and we tend to have shortages at the low end. What we're hoping, as we run hotter, is cities will beef up that skills training, and we can help improve the quality of our human capital and have more inclusive prosperity. It would be one of the ways, not the only one of the ways to help improve uh, inclusive prosperity. But if I'm understanding correctly, one of the things you're saying is that we are not going to solve the skills gap with a tight labor market. It is still going to be the job of counties and cities to figure out. You need structural out. changes. You need structural changes, and that's why you may know in the state of Texas, we were very active at the Dallas Fed in advising uh, governor, lieutenant governor, speaker of the house, uh, and advocating that we needed to improve early childhood literacy and expanded pre-K, improve uh, teacher comp, normally things the Fed doesn't get involved in because it's so critical to the future growth prospects of the state. And we've been big advocates of dramatically expanding uh, skills training uh, and we're active in advocating for that all through our district. Just for some more context, this is something that's been happening at a lot of Fed banks and something, uh, a change that uh, a lot of Fed presidents have been recognizing in their own districts, which is that um, for 10 years now, uh, political leaders have looked at monetary policymakers and said, you fix it. And I think um, right now something's happening where monetary policymakers who have access to a ton of data and a ton of researchers and a ton of CEOs are looking at the problem and they're going, no, 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 we don't have the right tools. You fix it. Yeah, so one of the jobs that I, one of the key parts of my job, in my opinion, is to analyze, do a good job analyzing the economy, make good monetary policy decisions, but in addition, call out the other drivers of economic growth. And what are those? We, we've got to improve uh, uh, la uh, labor force growth. And so I was listening carefully to the mayor, encouraging people to come to uh, Toronto and how welcoming they are. Uh, immigration in the United States is a sensitive subject, but immigration has been a substantial part of labor force growth. So we do a lot of research in the Dallas Fed and we call it out. Uh, improving education and skills training is going to improve productivity. We call it out. Uh, globalization, in particular, uh, we advocate, our work suggests that improving our alliances with Mexico and Canada and making North America into a much more competitive hemisphere, which we've been doing, will allow us to grow jobs in the U U.S. and take share from Asia. 
So we call those things out, and, and I just stay out of the politics of it, but I do walk right up to the line, and I even talk about climate change because we believe for sustainable growth of the state of Texas, for example, it's essential that we make improvements and make investments in the state of Texas if we're going to continue to grow. So yeah, I think that's part of my job. But this leads us to an institutional question about the role of the Federal Reserve and even the role of, of any monetary uh, body, uh, because you see this in Europe as well. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's some political dysfunction in the United States right now. Um, uh, <clears throat> and I'll stay away from that. Yeah, please, please. Um, I'll, uh, when I took the job of U.S. economics editor, um, one of the things that the editor-in-chief of the FT asked me is, how do you avoid getting captured by the Fed? How do you avoid falling in love with the Fed? And it's a valid question because the Federal Reserve is a functioning institution, and there aren't a lot of those left. And so if you ignore the politics of it, you're still left with all of us turning our lonely eyes to an institution that makes decisions we may disagree with, but at least seems to function. So have you seen the role of the Fed change over the last two years, over the last five years, over the last 10 years, because it is seen to be a functioning institution? So, so I mean, I've only been at the Fed, as you know, for four years, but all I can say is the board of the Dallas Fed uh, and, and the Board of Governors, to some extent, when they, when they asked me to consider doing this, they wanted, I'm a business person, I was at Goldman Sachs for 23 years, I'm an active business person and a professor, they wanted, some, but I'm not a PhD economist, and they wanted some diversity around the table, and my background is being more of a uh, 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 activist, you know, I was on the board of the Ford Foundation, and I'm accustomed to that. And so we have a big community outreach effort, and so I've, I've, we've sort of continued some of the things I did before I got here. And so I have a lot of support of my board. I think it, it may vary by Federal Reserve Bank, but I notice a number of leaders in the Fed believe this is a key part of our job, even though it is not squarely in the, in the strike zone of monetary policy. But I'll also say one other thing. I also think it's part of my job to say, uh, monetary policy has a key role to play in our economy, but it by itself, if we don't have broader economic policies, we're not going to grow, we're not going to, the way we should, we're not going to reach our potential. I've said publicly, you know, the recent slowing, our own analysis of the Dallas Fed, forget opinions, my, our own analysis uh, suggests that it has much more to do with uh, trade uncertainty, global growth deceleration probably less to do with monetary policy, although I think that we, we've got some things we've got to do better in monetary policy. And if we have a severe downturn, monetary policy will have a key role to play, but we'll need broader policy if we're going to address that downturn. Well, to put a fine point on exactly that, one of the concerns uh, that came out of the Jackson Hole Conference um, earlier uh, in, in August uh, was that not everybody there was completely certain that the traditional tools of monetary policy would work. So the, the, the cliche is that we're running out of ammunition. Do you see that in the U.S. or do you see that more broadly globally? Well, we, so we have more ammunition here, I think, relative to other central banks in the world. My own view, and we do a lot of debating about this at, at my bank and, 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 at, and I'll say with my colleagues at the Fed, I think monetary policy is still a very potent force. Uh, but there, there are limits. If you don't grow the workforce, if you don't uh, improve education and skills training, if you, uh, if you view globalization as a threat, and, and, and that I mean, if your job is being disrupted in the United States today, it's probably due to technology-enabled disruption. Fifteen years ago, it might have been due to globalization. If we don't get that analysis right, we're going to grow more slowly, and monetary policy can be helpful, but it's not going to it's not going to address those policy decisions. And I think my job is just we've got to call it out. So I was going to save this till the end, but we're there now. <clears throat> it's not a question that either you or I enjoy, but it is one that has become even more relevant in the last week. Uh, we have a policy uh, at the Financial Times, which is uh, a godsend to me because it changes my workload. We don't respond to tweets from the White House. There are just too many of them. We can't possibly chase them all down. That said, in the D.C. Bureau, last week, we were watching tweets coming from the White House about the Fed, and we thought, 
That is different. Even given the situation that we've been looking at over the last two years, that's, that's a new level of criticism. How does the Fed respond with continued levels of unprecedented political activity? Uh, by, by focusing on our dual mandate of full employment and price stability and, this, and, and screening out any political considerations or political influences. And the good news is it's a pretty veteran group around the table. I've done other things in my life. Many of us have, we've been around, I've got thick skin. I think criticism is, uh, of the Fed is to be expected. People outside the Fed should scrutinize us. I think uh, we are going to be subject to criticism. I think that's part of the job, and, uh, and we should accept that, and you have to have a thick skin yeah. and focus on the mandate without regard to any political considerations or political influence. And I, I'm, I, I've, that is what I've seen every day for the four years I've been at that, and I am quite confident that that is what we will continue to do. I think that's also something to keep in mind is that um, lots of presidents have leaned on the Fed. Um, and the Fed has sometimes leaned back. It's just that it's been very quiet, and we've only found out about it 20 years later when people write their memoirs. So what we're seeing now is something very loud that has happened quietly uh, in the past. I want to talk about financial markets because um, in May we talked, uh, and you said the Fed does not follow the U.S. equities market. The Fed looks I at... I don't. Well, you don't. But that's something I that... I watch it. I watch it, but I, as I've said, I watch it, I, I read, as I mentioned to you before, I look at every corporate earnings report, but that's my training. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I am not unduly influenced by that. I am very focused, as you were about to say probably, yeah. on credit conditions and tightening of financial conditions, but particularly cost and availability of capital, which by the way, at the moment, is very robust. But that's what I'm watching for. And I also watch uh, the Treasury curve, which is across the board, move down, particularly since May 1st, when a lot of these trade issues have intensified. And, and that I do, I do look carefully at all that information as sort of a reality check. And why? Because the markets uh, go up and down, but they are forward looking. So, I mean, you've said in the past that uh, one, area, one reason for concern is that the entire Treasury curve is below the Fed funds rate. Yes. What, what, what's, what's the mechanism there? Why does that concern you? So the, the Treasury market, uh, listen, the front end of the curve is heavily influenced by central bank expectations for the Fed. So that makes sense. The longer end of the curve, on the other hand, the 10 and the 30 year, I think, may, is certainly influenced by global liquidity, what's going on with global rates, but it's also, in my judgment, heavily influenced by the prospects for future growth. And I think the whole curve moving down, particularly at the long end, tells me that there's a lot more pessimism about future growth prospects. And that makes sense. It's consistent with what I'm seeing in terms of global growth decelerating and some other pockets of weakness we're seeing. People are, uh, if they look out over the horizon, and my job is not to look backward at data, what has been, it's to look forward over the next X period of time and so for, uh, what, what it tells me is the markets are at least foreshadowing that growth is slowing. Our own forecasts, I will tell you, at the Dallas Fed suggests that increasingly risk to our forecast are to the downside, and we've been revising down our outward forecasts. And, and I've said this publicly, and I'll say that if the Fed funds rate at two to two and a quarter is above every rate along the curve, including the 30-year, uh, that is not something that I'm going to ignore. And for those who say, well, there's reasons and this time is different, that may be true, but my experience in my career has been trying to make explanations on what's time, what this time is different haven't gone well. And, and last comment, we've looked through at the Dallas Fed going back to 1953 with help of some outsiders and certainly in earnest for the last 50 years, every time the Fed funds rate has been above the curve. And, um, and I've, and I've drawn, and I, I looked into what was going on at the time, what was the rhetoric, uh, including in 2006, saying, gee, rates are so low, it doesn't matter, there's a global savings glut. This is what was being said in 2006. So I, I do, for, for me, I do think it is relevant. 
and uh, it's something that's a factor in a reality check for me in thinking about whether monetary policy is too tight. So if the whole curve gets below the policy rate, is it the Fed's job then to get down there with the rest of the curve? So, so I'd say a couple things. One, the, the, the whole curve moving down, Fed, without even thinking about Fed action, has been stimulative. Okay, so the, the 10 year, just to remind people, it's hard to imagine, in the fall was over 3%. Okay, it is now moved down today to it's at 150. I can tell you that has been a dramatic boon to, uh, it, it, to, to real estate, mortgage, mortgage costs, to companies and their borrowing, and et cetera. And so a lot of the stimulative effect of a loosening has already happened. The question is, what is the implications of the Fed staying where it is and being above the rest of the curve? And my own view is it's going to create its own set of distortions and challenges, which may seem innocuous for a period of time, but I think eventually uh, uh, will be will may create uh, uh, issues which tighten financial conditions. So I'm watching this very carefully. And, and that is an amazing to think about uh, the, the time you're talking about when the when the tenure was at was it three? three over three. Uh, we were all sitting around in newsrooms thinking, is, is this it? Is this the beginning of a, of a permanent rise in U.S. borrowing costs? Is, this, you know, is, is, is the borrowing binge the federal government has been going through, is it finally going to have consequences? And the answer is, no, it is not. Well, the other comment I would make is, for those who, who wonder if there's going to be an easing, I can tell you, you can stop waiting. There's been an easing. In other words, by the whole curve moving down, the cost of capital for any company that accesses the curve uh, from you know, medium term to long term, it's been a dramatic uh, easing in financial conditions for them. And, and a part of it, uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but uh, I, I'm, I'm also cognizant of that. The question is, what are then the implications of us being well above every rate along the curve? And history has shown that when those situations have happened, even if the Fed held off for a while, it eventually has to. The curve is, I haven't seen a situation where the curve moved back up to where the Fed funds rate is. Normally, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of many indicators that I, that I pay attention to. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but since we are in Canada, and since you are the president of the Dallas Fed, um, let's talk about the oil patch. Yeah. Uh, in 2015, 2016, we saw a wholesale reorganization of what was happening uh, in, in the various shale basins um, because the price of oil dropped from about 80 to about 20 within six months. Um, we're seeing softness in the oil patch again, um, and that's having consequences for manufacturing numbers in the United States. Compare 2015, 2016 to what's happening now. Are those two similar trends, or are we looking at two completely different ones? So, so our own analysis, and we have a big energy group at the Dallas Fed, uh, for obvious reasons, because of the, the substantial production in Texas and Permian Basin. Um, if you go back to 14, 15, and part of 16, we felt very strongly the world was oversupplied, okay? Part of it was shale production, but part of it was uh, you know, increase in supply from OPEC and OPEC nations, and we felt we were oversupplied, and what we were watching was, uh, as demand was growing, uh, we were working off that oversupply. It was our own judgment that we got into relatively rough global balance sometime late 16, sometime in 17 in that neighborhood. We still think we're roughly in global supply demand balance. And the reason it's hard to judge is you've got the Iran situation, sanctions, waivers, Venezuela situation, Libya situation. So you've got lots of outages and, and issues. But um, our own view is at this point, um, while shale is growing, the decline curve of shale is as much as 70% in year one. So just to grow production, which we think it will grow at 1 million net this year, to keep up that growth rate, you've got to keep drilling more and more and more and more. We, are, we think it's unlikely that, uh, that shale will be able to cut, keep up with global growth. Now, why is the price weak right now? It's because it's more of a demand. We believe it's always supply and demand, but right now, Concerns about global growth deceleration are causing people to think there's going to be less demand for oil, and that makes sense. Uh, and depending on how global growth goes, uh, 
this could get more uh, difficult. And it's the reason why in, I can tell you in Texas, the oil and gas producers we talk to are cutting back or being very careful on CapEx. Also, capital providers, as many of you in the who know the business know, are being much tougher and want a rate of return. And so we would expect uh, net growth from the Permian next year will be dramatically lower than it was this year unless something changes. And again, I'd say the same thing. Uh, we think over the next three to five years, we think it's just as likely or more likely we'll be in a global undersupply as oversupply situation. Robert Kaplan, that was elegantly done. I want everybody to know that he wrapped that up with five, four, <laughs> right. three. We are out of time. Thank you so much, as always, Robert Thank Kaplan. Thank you, Brendan.